uh, Florida, from the uh, this part of the uh, U.S., and he will be the last speaker in this presentation. We have changed a little bit uh, our program. And uh, Alejandro will also talk about uh, different approaches, especially the interior. Approach. Alejandro, can you introduce the other speakers in this session? Alejandro, we cannot hear you. You are mute. Yeah. yeah um, uh, Oliver, I don't know if Carlos is around or not. Is yes, he, Carlos, Carlos will talk at the end. Yeah, having talked with him. Yeah. Wonderful. So Carlos Higuera Rueda, or obviously from the Cleveland Clinic in Florida, a very well known, respected scientist and surgeon. It's a pleasure to have him uh, with us today. Uh, Jeff Gasden is the chief of regional anesthesia in uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Jeff and I, we met in New York when he was invited to be our visiting professor. Um, this year, it was really, really a pleasure to get to know him and uh, see how well uh, he does. Dr. Hosak, um, you know, most of us followed his uh, academic and professional career over the course of many years. Very insightful speaker. It's an honor to have him in the podium. Uh, he's obviously from the Rothman Institute in, in Philadelphia, and we look forward to what we have no doubt will be a very insightful presentation. Thank you. Oh, from the University Pasto Narin in Colombia. And finally, uh, Per Hasgarden Andersen from, from Bale in, in Denmark. So these are the different Different talks that we will see uh, next. Um, we will start with the first uh, block, Alejandro, and you will introduce the questions and, and the speakers. And remember, Carlos Higuera will be the last speaker in this block. Thank you, Oliver. So we, uh, Per, will start with his first talk, how to start an ERAS program in uh, arthroplasty. Uh, per? Thank you, Alessandro. Yes, my presentation. So, yeah, just one back. Thank you so much for your kind invitation to tell you about tips and tricks, uh, which we have been going on for, for uh, six minutes. I think it's impossible. I'll try to do my best. I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. Basically, this is a concept with several names and enhanced recovery, I think, has been the one who have been hitting mostly. What it is has to be defined, or maybe we can have this in the discussion, but from my point of view, it's a level of information, education, very important pain treatment, and then very clear discharge criteria. Looking at what tricks we can discuss, I have listed them here, and I'll try to go through them in six minutes if I can. Those highlighted here are, is when you have to start off. You have really to make a definition of what you're going to go for. Next, you must convince uh, your surroundings, many leaders and the whole staff on the program you're going to run. So they will support you as much as possible. Then we did a very dedicated job in trying to describe all the details in the full program, even before we started back in 2003. And in this uh, sentence here, also the staff was involved. And finally, we should educate everyone in why and how we're going to do this. This is from one of the presentations which uh, Professor Kaled gave in Lancet or uh, who they gave in 
in active orthopedica with the main issues. But I think we can discuss later on what is what is really the main issue. And when starting back in 2003, it clearly was length of stay. You have to focus on how to get the patients out as soon as possible and as safe as possible. Where you need it is to create a team spirit. If anyone within your team do not support what you're going to do, uh, yeah, I can tell you it will be complicated and nearby impossible. We had from the very first day the intention to have a high information to the patients what's mm -hmm. going on, mainly because we came from a long stay of 12 to 13 days and in Italy we wanted to go down to seven days. And for that reason, we, over the years, made leaflets, which we did send to the patients before they showed up, and also made patient seminar groups, where we tried to motivate them to take the program. Finally, we had this seminar as a mandatory thing. And as time passed on, we learned that we have to separate hips and knees because we are discussing different things. The seminar is mainly for patients in the week before surgery. And it, in my clinic, could look like this. And who are indicating it's the surgeon, the anesthetist, who talk about anesthesia and pain treatment, and finally also the physiotherapist. It is led by the nurses in our department. Pain program, which we will learn more on in, the, in the, one of the next presentations, is the main issue in my opinion. And here is what we are doing currently. We started that in 2019. One of the game changers was when we started giving intravenous uh, prednisone where we really went down in pain treatment and also better uh, rehabilitation problems for the patients. We learned that mobilization can be a lot of different things, but mobilization basically is getting out of the bed. And this was one of the goals where we started on very early. And uh, in the beginning, it was complicated due to the nurses and the physiotherapists because they had a, an opinion why the patients would be mobilized or not. But during the time and today, it is not an issue anymore. Everyone is mobilized. The first cases in the morning are mobilized and even are dining at lunchtime, as you see here. Cases have uh, x-rays during the afternoon. And if they can fulfill these criteria you can see here, they are allowed to go home. And today, 80% of our hips going home on the day of surgery. And finally, it is important to educate and inform the full staff of what you're doing. So they know that they have the ownership of the outcomes also, because a lot of things can threat uh, your uh, intentions, but you have to show them all the opportunities. It has been clear that my staff has been stressed a lot, a heavy workload, but they have also learned that we have less complications. They have learned that we have increased our production dramatically over the years, as you will see in my next presentation. And finally, we are working more evidence-based today because we're doing a lot of research around it. So this was my uh, initial presentation on the ERAS. Thank you. Thank you, Per. It was a, a fantastic introduction to this topic. Indeed, Denmark was one of the first countries to start with this and haze recovery protocols in many surgeries. So thank you so much for these tips and tricks and just uh, looking in 10 years or more follow-up. So uh, next speaker is a great honor to present uh, Alejandro Gonzalez de la Valle from New York, HSS, that will present a very fashion topic. He's going to talk about direct anterior approach in total hip arthroplasty and uh, the relation with these uh, fast recovery protocols. Alejandro. Uh, thank you so much, Oliver. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, perfectly. Wonderful. So focusing on the direct anterior approach and if it makes a difference in fast recovery protocols. As some of you may know, the direct anterior approach was reinvigorated in the United States over 20 years ago, uh, based on the results or the reports of its pioneers, claiming reduced surgical trauma, shorter recovery, improved short-term outcomes, and reduced dislocation rate. And this is the publication trends in PubMed on the direct anterior approach. During the first year, it was years after that publication, it was clear that as direct anterior approach, approach was being adopted by others, there were reports of increased bleeding, surgical time, wound complications, hematoma formation, femoral fracture, 
and nerve injury. However, as surgeons went through their learning curve, it became very clear that it's a very safe approach. In this comparative study, we analyzed essentially 4,700 patients, half and half anterior and posterior approaches, matched for demographic factors, and we studied their early local complications within the one year. This is the intraoperative complications for anterior and posterior approach respectfully on, in blue, the likelihood of returning to the operating room for any reason, and the combine of both outcomes. None of these three outcome variables proved to be significant even after controlling for co-founders. There have been a number of comparative studies reporting on PROMS, comparing patients with a direct anterior and posterior approach. You can see this timeline since the operation for the first 24 months and different PROMS on studying reporting on an increasing number of patients. As you can see, a number of the studies favor the direct anterior approach for PROMS. A number of them report no difference and to my knowledge, none of them have favored the posterior approach. The reality is that patients prefer the anterior approach in general terms to the anterior approach. If you ask them individually, this is a crossover study of uh, patients who underwent an anterior and a posterior approach. You can see how the majority of them not only prefer it, but also claim a, a faster recovery. The reality is that the surgical approach has changed the landscape in the United States. This is data from the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons showing how you have an increased number of users for the direct anterior approach, trend which seems to be crossing the Atlantic. In the European Hip Society, 20% of surgeons use the approach in 2020. Now, Patients also look for this approach online. This is a Google Trends search analysis for the different surgical approaches between 2007 to, and 2021. You can see how the uh, interest of patients for the direct anterior approach surpasses that for a posterior approach and for other factors. Now, this is data from our own hospital. We have approximately 32 to 35 surgeons doing so primary hip replacements. Those who have been in practice for more than 15 years definitely prefer the posterior approach, whereas the, those who have been in practice for a shorter period of time preferentially prefer the anterior approach, which is used either for the majority of their patients or for a selected group of candidates. So this is what's happening in the hospital for the last uh, seven years. You can see how today the number of anterior approaches has increased substantially and one every three operations is done through that particular approach. This is the proportion of surgeons who use the direct anterior approach at least in one case per year you can see the numbers creeping up for the direct anterior approach. And this is probably the money slide showing how with efforts associated with a fast recovery, patients definitely have a shorter length of stay, but the direct anterior approach patients have a shorter length of stay, of stay than those that undergo surgery through a posterior approach. There has been an increased interest in ambulatory arthroplasty and some patients are scheduled to have surgery on the same day but cannot leave. That's what we call failure to launch. This is data from the NYU Medical Center in Manhattan. You can see that the proportion of patients that fail to launch with the anterior approach is smaller than with the posterior approach, even after con controlling for co-founders co-variables, and keeping in mind that in this particular study, readmissions, revision rates, and PROMs prove to be similar between the two groups. This is a smaller study from HSS focusing only on thrombogenic markers of, inf of for thrombosis in patients who go uh, undergo surgery for both approaches. But keep in mind that in this short study, the anterior group had a shorter length of stay, readiness to discharge, and met PT criteria for discharge much sooner than those who underwent surgery through a posterior approach. Now, still in HSS, our latest data indicates that if you have surg ambulatory surgery through an anterior and posterior approach, there is no significant higher rate of you being discharged home on the same day if you use the anterior approach. So I definitely look forward to Dr. Rueda, Higuera Rueda's presentation on the use of the posterior approach. To finalize, these are the most I am a, I trained with the posterior approach and I adopted the anterior approach later in my life. 
I find that the most striking differences deviating from the workflow of the posterior approach are related to implant selection and planning, OR setting and equipment, the decubitus, the acetabular and femoral planes of reference, and capsular management. To finalize, there are advantages of being proficient with different surgical approaches to the hip, allows you to remain competitive, at least in the US. You'll have a personal perception of advantages, disadvantages. You'll be able to select which cases you'll feel comfortable indicating for the anterior approach. And most importantly, talk to patients from the standpoint of somebody who is proficient in more than one surgical approach. Hopefully this will allow you to provide personalized care and the faster recovery in the appropriately selected patient. Thank you for your attention and we look forward to the next presentations. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, amazing presentation uh, that you, you suggest that the approach is one of the key factors for this uh, rapid recovery. But now uh, our next speaker is Jeff Ganzden. Jeff uh, will talk about another factor that is so important uh, for this um, situation, that is uh, the intraoperative and postoperative anesthetic management, the big chain in this uh, rapid recovery. Jeff, try to convince us that the problem is inside the OR and not the approach. You are mute, Jeff. There we go. Sorry, I had to yeah, don't worry. stop showing my screen for a sec to unmute. So thank you so much um, to uh, to Alejandro for the invitation and, and Oliver for moderating and to Seagot for uh, for having me here. This is a, I love working with orthopedic surgeons every day. And so this is a real passion of mine. And I, I wanted to share with you some very practical tips in and, and a story that we went through in the last five to eight years that has changed how we manage these patients for total hip and, and and give you some some practical advice and 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 how we how we do it. So this is this is our goal, right? We want patients awake, alert, happy, zero complications and walking out the door very soon after their surgery. And we have achieved this in the vast majority of patients now our our our, our uh, same day discharge. Um, the things that prevent people from going home on the same day or uh, in Alejandro's, I love that failure to launch um, uh, language, are pain, orthostasis, motor weakness from some of the blocks that we might do, and urinary retention. These are the four horsemen of failure to launch. Um, and we have ways to, we have, we have addressed all of these in different ways. Um, I first want to just talk quickly about spinal anesthesia. This is our default. This is uh, in 2023. I do believe that spinal anesthesia is the standard of care from the point of view of complications alone. So if you give spinal versus general, you're way less likely to have an, any adverse event, less likely to have blood transfusion, unplanned intubation, and 380% less likely to have a cardiac arrest. Um, Plus, it takes longer. You spend more time in the OR if you have to do a general anesthetic. So let's do spinal anesthesia uh, anesthetics for all of our total hip patients. And this is a study, a more recent study that um, Dr. Marin was involved in uh, showing that, yes, if you do use regional anesthesia, you have 30% fewer complications. So from a, from a safety and complication point of view, spinal is the standard. Now, we do spinals in a different way than we used to. We used to give everyone a bupivacaine spinal because it worked and it lasted a long time. And the problem was it lasted too long and it was not commensurate with our goals of getting people out of hospital the same day. And we have data to show that you know, uh, while a lot of people that came spinals might last for two or three hours, some of them lasted for six, seven, eight hours. And that's the sensory block. The real problem was with a sympathetic block, which we know lasts longer than the sensory block, was making people orthostatic and they couldn't get up. They get up and they, they get dizzy and they'd fall back down into bed for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours. And so that was, that was provoking, um, you know, our physical therapists would say, uh-uh, you are staying overnight for your launch. And so the problem we all we realized with Pivacaine is it lasts for a long time. So we've switched to Mepivacaine or Lidocaine spinals, which only lasts for 120 minutes. And so that's been really great for us. We have seen a, a 
significant decrease in the number of patients that have hypotension or orthostasis when they go up to do their physical therapy in the recovery room. We have a decreased urinary retention rate. So we used to do your uh, fully catheters for everyone getting a hip. And then we stopped doing that and just did straight caths in the PACU if they needed it. And even that has gone down significantly since we switched to a short acting spinal. But the problem, the, the kicker is the clock is ticking. So you have to do your spinal at the right time. We do all of our spinals in the preoperative area right before rolling back. And that allows us to parallel process and not have to use valuable operative time in the OR um, to do our spinal and our blocks. Speaking of blocks, um, we used to do all kinds of different things for, for hips, epidurals, femoral blocks, fascia iliaca. Love them. They're great. They provide great pain control. The problem is they provide a motor weakness and they can't walk. And so we now do as our standard block, the PENG block. And this is a uh, pericapsular block getting the articular branches, but only the articular branches of the femoral nerve and the obturator and the accessory obturator. So we bring a needle down under ultrasound guidance, hit the pubic ramus here, and the local anesthetic spreads along the ramus under the psoas tendon and iliacus and spreads over the joint capsule, getting that anterior medial capsule. Um, <clears throat> very easy to do, very simple. Um, hit a bone with a needle, and um, we can teach our residents how to do this in in a matter of uh, hours. Um, another big part of the pain control piece is the multimodal. And I, I saw that PER uses a lot of the same things we do, acetaminophen, we use NSAIDs. Um, ketamine is very important. That's been shown to decrease opioids, even a very, very small dose like we're using, and and steroids. And I, I'd like to see that uh, that uh, the pair also uses uh, steroids. So we do a dose in the OR and then a dose on post-op day one. And that's been shown to decrease length of stay as well in, in total joint arthroplasty. One thing we don't use is long-acting opioids. Um, so we've gotten away from morphine and hydromorphone. We will use a little bit of uh, fentanyl in the recovery room as the spinal's wearing off, and that tends to get people over the hump, and a little bit of um, PO oxycodone. And so that allows them to, to transition from the spinal to not having a spinal, and but it doesn't have all the, the bad side effects of those long-acting opioids like dizziness and orthostasis and urinary retention. I don't, we are no longer right for long acting opioids. If the nurse finds that this is not cutting it, I want her or him to call me and then I can go to see the patient in the PACU and figure out what is, what is going on. So this is our recipe. We have uh, in the pre-op area, we do uh, acetaminophen, PO, we do a lidocaine spinal, we do our pang block and a lateral pharmacotaneous nerve block to get some of that um, the, for the posterior uh, hips for the incisional site. Intra-op, they all get a propofol infusion to keep them comfortable and, and uh, unaware of things. They get the steroid, the ketamine, and the TXA. And then post-op, only oxycodone um, for their for their um, for the pain needs for opioids if they need it. But what the base of their their pain is met by um, uh, NSAIDs and Tylenol, uh, NSAIDs and acetaminophen for those ten days afterwards. And so if you look back at the at these four factors that really uh, predict failure to launch, our pain block and our multimodal are taking care of the pain. Our short-acting spinal, avoidance of a long-acting spinal, and the avoidance of opioids is taking care of the orthostasis. We take care of the motor weakness by, again, avoiding those old-fashioned blocks and doing a pain block and our short spinal, so they aren't sitting with motor weakness in the PACU for a long time. And then, of course, again, Having a short spinal and then avoiding opioids contributes to a decreased urinary retention rate as, as well. So a thoughtful application of some of these uh, ERAS interventions, intra- and post-operative, has really made a big difference for us in allowing those patients to get up, uh, complete their physical therapy in the recovery room, and get out the door that same day. So that's just a brief overview of, um, <laughs> and, a, and a very, very quick uh, summary of uh, a lot of the, the thought that has gone into um, things that we can do with anesthesiology to, to move the needle on, on ERAS for hip arthroplasty. So I'm happy to answer any questions and give you some more detail uh, during the discussion session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Amazing. So we have a great discussion. I mean, some people think anesthesiologists that the main issue is intraoperative. Alejandro has said that this is the anterior approach. And Alejandro, you don't mind? Can we introduce now Carlos? 
Um, of course, um, uh, Oliver, uh, Carlos is really great to have you. Um, Carlos is the um, the, uh, the department chairman of the orthopedic surgery in the Cleveland Clinic in um, in Florida, and I know him for many years. Obviously, a lot of us follow his uh, academic career. Very well published uh, physician and surgeon. And um, it's a great pleasure to um, have you being part of this uh, webinar and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, it highlights that there is no uh, perfect way of doing things, just different ways of doing so. So, Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Alejandro, for the invitation. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. All right. So I don't really have any conflicts related to this work. And probably as Alejandro already showed, uh, I mean, there is plenty of evidence that the enhanced recovery pathway uh, can be used regardless of the approach for uh, total hip replacements. Uh, that was from 2016. Um, this one is just basically shows that when you do a good posterior approach, that's quote unquote minimal invasive, uh, patients can go home. Uh, this uh, paper that, uh, Dr. Uh, Alejandro already showed that basically there is no difference between um, anterior or posterior approach. Uh, and then if you follow them uh, overall long term, uh, there is no difference really between the approaches. But, um, you know, the devil is in the details. And I really want to go to the way how we do it, or at least I, I do it. I Maybe the only disclosure I have is that I'm the only posterior approach in my group. Uh, guys, so I'm just going to tell you how I do it. Uh, in order for these patients to go home, uh, the main strategies is to manage the expectation and the pain management as uh, Jeff already showed it. Um, and the managing expectation is basically uh, divided in three topics. Pre-op education is a team approach delivering the same measures that basically the patient is going home. No matter what, you are going home. And the pain management, I'm just going to show you some of the things that Jeff already uh, showed. So managing the expectations. Uh, so we already have some uh, guidelines of what patients can be outpatient and what patients can be inpatient. And maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about it in the discussion. Uh, but we basically, as you already know, uh, the preoperative optimization is key. Some of the diabetics, we check hemoglobin A1C, has to be less than seven. Uh, we have actually a social uh, worker that... Um, screen all patients for depression and other mental conditions, uh, smoking cessation, immunosuppression evaluation, etc. cetera. Um, one thing that has, uh, over the years, I have learned that is extremely important is to an evaluation of the social support. What that means is, does the patient have somebody that can come and bring him and pick him up after surgery, somebody that will be with the patient at home? Uh, Pre-op evaluation from physical therapy. So we have uh, an evaluation to know what type of uh, physical therapy needs is going to patient uh, half uh, after the surgery. And we have a lot of education materials. Every, every patient receives a booklet. We actually have a YouTube video. You can actually look for it. Uh, we have this video in two languages, English and Spanish. We have a, a big uh, Spanish-speaking population. And we have online educa education uh, modules as part of the Cleveland Clinic Enterprise that is actually in five languages. And one thing that we have changed recently that have helped a lot is there are a couple of papers that talk of having a good pre, uh, pre-operative oral hydration. It's not that the patient... Uh, the, the after midnight, the day bef before surgery, doesn't drink anything. They actually can have some uh, water or clear liquids. Uh, we actually give them some Gatorade so the patient comes to surgery and is not dehydrated. Intraoperatively, we actually, as a difference of many other places, we don't use spinals. It's just because the anesthesiologists, we don't have good reproducibility with our spinals. So we actually, we use uh, intravenous general anesthesia uh, with Steva, and actually we have had really good results with this. As Jeff already mentioned, uh, urinary retention was a big deal in the past for us. Uh, we don't use uh, glycopyrrolate. Uh, instead of uh, for the muscle relaxant, we use uh, Sugatamex, and, and these patients is a little bit more expensive. I think the long term is obviously uh, cost effective because if the patient doesn't spend, spend the time, the night at home is well worth it. We use TXA, um, it depends on the venue. Sometimes we use it orally or sometimes we use it IV and pain management. I'm going to talk a little bit, but that's a whole uh, different component. Obviously, the patient is in pain, won't be able to go home. 
So when the patient arrives to a preoperative area, we give them oxycodone, 10 milligrams, one dose. If it's uh, older than 70, we don't do this. Uh, we use paracetamol uh, just orally, and then we always use dexamethasone. Actually, we uh, uh, have a level one study that we did in our own shop, and for that reason, we use 10 milligrams IV one dose. It helps with pain and postoperative nausea. And here it says knee injection cocktail, but actually we use the same injection uh, for the hips, uh, as you can see it there. Uh, it is key to minimize the OR time. Uh, and then after surgery, we use Ketorolac. That's a big player for us. Obviously, the patient has a renal failure, then um, we cannot use this. But as you can see here in patients that are older than 65, we use a uh, half of the dose. And then oxycodone all, all, only for rescue. Uh, we really try to avoid any narcotics IV in the postoperative area. We prefer just to use Ketorolac. And then the patient goes home um, just with uh, tramadol. Again, uh, if the patient stayed 23 hours, then we use uh, dexamethasone again, and we can use this combination of other things. Early ambulation, patient uh, has physical therapy and start ambulating within an hour of the surgery. Ice packs, obviously, we don't use any PCAs. And this is uh, what we use when the patient goes home. We use aspirin for DVT prophylaxis, uh, 81 BID for four weeks. Meloxicam, as you can see it here, ice frequently, paracetamol, and tramadol, no more than 30 pills. And these are just uh, quick and dirty numbers. These are just my numbers. I'm actually just looking at this this past week. Uh, we have a practice of five surgeons just last year. We did a, about 1,100 uh, total hips. That 209 of those were mine. I'm, again, I'm the only one that does a posterior approach. And as you can see, 110 went home the same day, 72 stay in observation. So it's about they went home within 23 hours and the rest uh, were inpatient. And this is the whole practice, uh, meaning 87% on, 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 close to 90% of the hips uh, went home within 23 hours. So in conclusion, I think that ERAS uh, total hip using the posterior approach is possible. It's basically about managing the expectations in TIP approach always delivering the same message. Education is key, and then using multimodal pain uh, management. Uh, obviously, you have to set up this program depending on what you have available. Thank you very much. Uh, Carlos, that was amazing and certainly uh, admirable, the proportion of posterior pro pa patients that, uh, uh, that you sent home. The proportion is really, really big. Um, I think that we, we uh, I'm going to call you after the webinar and get some uh, pointers from you. Um, now, moving forward, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, William Hosack from the Rothman Institute, who is going to discuss with us uh, he, his uh, idea and what he has seen about the use of ambulatory arthroplasty more and more frequently used in the US, meaning that the patient knows that he or she is going to go home the same day of the operation, something that we never thought it would be possible. Uh, so, uh, Bill, we look forward to your insightful presentation. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, give me a second to share my screen. There it is. I'm assuming I'm online now. Um, I, as a representative of the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, symposium. I'm going to talk about my experience over two decades with working towards stain day discharge, and it currently is our standard of care. What's the big issue that we f I first came across or we came across was really the fear, the fear that patients had about going home. They did not feel safe going home. And that mindset was really given to the patient by everybody else in the hospital. Everybody felt outside the hospital and inside the hospital that it was not safe to go home. And the patient would resist that uh, suggestion and insist on staying in the hospital or uh, if they didn't stay in the hospital, request a, a, an additional stay in another hospital, which we call the rehab re rehabilitation hospital. So the challenge that was faced by us was uh, to change the mindset to uh, to the mindset that there is no place better than being at home. And that was a big challenge that took many years to overcome. So the solution that we adopted was to take baby steps, right? First, we attempted to show patients and others 
in our hospital that going home was indeed a safe option. This is a publication that uh, was in General Bone and Joint Surgery showing that patients who actually live alone could also be safely discharged directly home after total hip arthroplasty, uh, published in 2018. A study that was published, uh, not really a study, but a findings from the Department of Health and Human Services of the United States showed that as adverse events and rehabilitation hospitals were higher than might would be might one might expect. So indeed, going to a rehabilita- rehabilitation hospital, and there was another hospital, was not necessarily a safe op- option. So having convinced the patients that maybe it's okay to go home, the next step was to try same-day discharge from our regular hospital. And the way that worked was it gave us a, a safety net. In other words, the patient had the ability to stay overnight if they didn't achieve the goals that we felt they needed to achieve to be safe to go home. And during that time, it gave us as a team time to fine tune all the processes that weren't quite correctly organized. And so we were able to make changes over time and keep the patient safe. This was published again in CORE in 2017, which was a a, a multi-center randomized study where patients were randomized into either go home the same day or go home the next day, but they were allowed to cross over in other words, patients, so what happened is patients that were randomized into going home the next day, some of them actually went home the same day, and other patients who were randomized into go home the same day actually ended up staying in the hospital overnight. So it was a little bit of a safety net, but it allowed us to fine-tune our processes. And then finally, which has happened more uh, recently, is they changed from a same-day discharge to an ambulatory surgery center, which there is no safety net really, although you could technically still admit the patient to the hospital. Our results over the years, in the beginning, the same day discharge was under 15% and currently it's higher than 70% discharge, either from an ambulatory surgery center or from our, our regular hospital. So what did it take? What was the process? Every slide here could be a separate six or 10 minute talk. Commitment, let's get this done, the number one thing. Number two, teamwork. Everybody has to be on the same page. A single person that creates any any sort of uncertainty about the value of going home will, will jeopardize that patient going home. And a consistent message to everybody, especially the patient and the fa- family, that it's okay to go home, and they will go home and be safe. Everything needed to be changed. So it took a lot of time, and change is very uncomfortable. Uh, I love this slide about herding cats because it reminds me of trying to keep our our joint replacement surgeons uh, on the same page about protocols. I'm sure Dr. Gass can, can understand that. And then sometimes gentle encouragement, right? Um, will you please get with the program, uh, right? Because as surgeons and team members, we had to sit down with everybody and re- redefine what the goals were on a regular basis. But at the end of the day, that change of mindset did occur. So what seemed in the past to be impossible became a possibility and a reality. The most important thing, and these are all simple things, protocols, pathways, standardization of care, hopefully evidence-based care. If no evidence existed, try to study it and develop that evidence. And I'm not going to cover anything in detail because each one of these, again, could be a separate talk. But Risk reduction by the pre-admission process, medical optimization, one publication by Dr. Meneghini shows one way to do it. Short-acting spinals, again, there's more to this than just a short-acting spinal. Uh, We have our own publication on bupivacaine versus bupivacaine, allowing us to get patients up quicker with fewer uh, side effects. Surgical protocols, independent of the approach, the operation needs to be quick, efficient, and predictable. Minimize blood loss so the patient doesn't faint or doesn't have to be readmitted and and jeopardize the process. Tranexamic acid has been extremely helpful, but it's also how you do the operation. And then create a stable hip with good fixation that so that we can allow immediate weight bearing and minimize patient restrictions. And these are publications of ours. Pain management, opiate sparing analgesia, a publication from 2019 of ours that minimized things like nausea, vomiting, and fainting after surgery. And of course, we all have our own particular pain management technique 
I tend to use intravenous medication in the operating room because the short acting spinals wear off very quickly. So it's almost like getting a general anesthesia. So we put intravenous medication in early and then continue post-op with oral medication and periodic uh, narcotics. Rapid mobilization is a whole game plan. It's short acting spinals, minimizing blood loss, reducing pain, Minimizing nausea, as I've discussed with Zofran, IV, dexamethasone, fainting by minimizing narcotics and short acting sp spinals and minimizing activity restrictions. The therapy protocols are not complicated. You do need adequate staffing. We try to begin in the recovery room, which really is in the ASC, the ambulatory center, um, and have simple and clear goals for the therapist. Actually, we don't always use therapy to start our mobilization. We actually have the nurses trained to do this, but the ultimate discharge criteria are listed here, at least for us. And after they're discharged from the hospital, it, they are not abandoned. Uh, we have protocols to cover follow-up care in the first and second weeks after surgery, so patients are supported as if they might even be in the hospital, but in a safer environment at home. This is a publication just uh, recently in my favorite journal. Uh, I saw knee replacement, but uh, it talks about actually outpatient total knee arthroplasty decreases the overall complications compared to staying in the hospital. So what has also changed in our demographics? I'll go through this. Over the years of a 10-year period, uh, we have changed our demographics. In the beginning, uh, only 20 uh, under 10% of our patients are over the age of 80, or over the age of 70. Now it's close to 15% over the age of 70. High BMI patients over 30 were a lower, a lower frequency, under 30%. Now it's over 40% of our patients that go home saying they're over BMI of 30. Same thing for ASA category, higher levels of uh, uh, worse uh, medical status. We have a higher percentage of patients in the ASA 3 category. So at this point, our current standard of care is to assume the patient is going to go home. And at this point, 71% of our patients do so on the same day of surgery. Not overnight, they stay same uh, day. So my learning points, same day surgery requires a change of mindset, a commitment, a teamwork, and time. Evidence-based protocols pave the way for success, and those are listed here. And one last point, same day discharge total hip arthroplasty protocols applied to inpatient total hip arthroplasty will actually reduce the length of stay. Thank you for your attention. It's my pleasure to be part of this uh, symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Bill. Uh, let's move now to the discussion. We have uh, some delay. So we have to reduce a little bit our discussion, but we have some minutes for this interesting discussion. So uh, we have seen here many presentations, and everyone thinks that the the the, the, the topic is is the main topic to the recovery. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised about that. But we will start with one question that we, they sent us from the audience from India. Uh, there is a question for our anesthesiologist. So Jeff, they are asking about the concern to use steroids, corticoids. So this is a very, very, very frequent uh, question about that. So can you explain that, the, the current position of uh, from the anesthesiologist's point of, point of view? Yes. Uh, thanks for the question. So the two big concerns that we've always had are, will it have, will corticosteroids have an effect on wound healing? And the answer is no. All the data we've seen, all the data we've managed to collect uh, both in, internally and in the literature suggests that there's not a, a short course of steroids perioperatively will have no effect on wound healing. Um, and the other one is, is glycemic control. So when we have diabetics who have uh, trouble with sugars, we've had to make the decision, what's more important? Do we get the um, anti-inflammatory effects of the steroid or do we avoid steroids and, and, and defend the sugars? We're really good at managing sugars. Uh, we can do that. And so our position usually is give the steroids and then just pay close attention to the, to their glycemic control. And so, so they, they steroids, and I'm sure, um, Para would agree with me. Um, steroids are safe and very, very effective anti-inflammatories that help people get up and moving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know this one, Carlos, had you raised your hand? Any question? 
Yeah, if, if I may add, I mean, for, for this topic, um, ACAS actually recently published, uh, they did a huge review of the literature of all the options that we have available for uh, perioperative uh, management of pain, including steroids. And um, there's plenty of level one data. It just shows that it's safe, not only for infection, but to management of the perioperative glucose. It doesn't really have a significant effect. I mean, and, and I really encourage the audience to look for uh, those guidelines because they are very helpful, will help to uh, make decisions. Right. So it looks that corticoids is, is one of the the, the the most important thing that we have added in our protocol. So uh, please ask your questions if you want to to, to see the, the, the reply from our speakers. So uh, Alejandro, I, I'm a little bit surprised about these two very um, nice positions about the approach from Carlos and from you. Uh, and you have presented that the, the patients and the surgeons want the direct anterior approach in US. That's very obvious with your presentation. But can you say that the clinical outcomes of one year or two years are much better? Or, or what, what do you mean about with, with this clinical out outcomes? No, I mean, if I had to guess, and there is a plenty of uh, evidence in the literature that is very likely that the potential beneficial effects of the direct, direct anterior approach are short-lived, meaning that the long-term outcome of the operation is unlikely to be affected by the surgical approach. And if you follow the literature very, very closely, there is only one uh, potential complication that I think may be uh, uh, a little bit more preventable with the, with the anterior approach, which is the risk of dislocation. Uh, when you are moving to the posterior approach and you want to match the uh, risk of revision for dislocation, um, you can certainly lower the risk of dislocation of patients with a posterior approach, but you have to leverage other factors, including the use of larger diameter heads, uh, dual mobility liners, uh, let's say um, variations of the classic posterior approach, there is a fair amount of evidence indicating that you pre if you are able to technically preserve the piriformis tendon, the uh, likelihood of dislocation may be a little bit lower. But the clinical outcomes, I think, in long term, unaffected. The reality is that I saw, you saw the numbers in our hospital. If you have an anterior approach, your average length of stay will be 10 hours less than if you use a posterior approach. It's a great point, but Carlos, um, at least in, in Spain or in Europe, um, this anterior approach uh, looks like more of fashion than a real you know, change in, the, in our management. What do you think about that? I mean, are we getting some pressure from patients and, and maybe companies and, and other, co other surgeons to, to do this anterior approach? Or what about the complication? I mean, the malposition or interpretive fractures. Yeah, I I think um, and for me, and I have one of my mentors here, Bill Hozak, he taught me how to do anterior approach. And actually, when I started my practice, I, I was the first one in the Cleveland Clinic to do anterior approach. Uh, and I did it for almost five years. And um, I think the main reasons I went back to posterior approach one was because it started to evidence started to come out just showing that it was safer. And I actually personally had a couple of complications. Uh, but number two, also for education, because uh, some of the fellows and the residents, they actually wanted to see uh, posterior approach. And uh, to be honest, I lose patients uh, because I do posterior approach because they want to have an anterior approach. So I often tempted to go back. But I believe that it is not the approach. It is the surgeon. I think that it is the surgeon experience, the uh, surgery skill to do that approach in a good manner. And when I have friends and family that call me from different parts of the world and they ask me, should I have an anterior approach? Should I have a posterior approach? I tell them, don't worry about the approach. Worry about the surgeon. Just be sure that the surgeon has enough experience. He has already good documented outcomes. That is more important to me than the approach. So we have a crossfire here, Alejandro. Any comment? You're mute. Uh, no, it's not a crossfire at all. It's just um, some general thought. Uh, um, I would think that if I had to give advice, 
is that I, I will give two advices. The first one is whatever you do, you do it to the to the best of your abilities, right? And there is no question that the more you do, the better you are, right? That's uh, a general term, term in life. Now, if I had to advise a very young orthopedic surgeon, I would give him or her the advice of being proficient with more than one approach. It has complete, the fact that I'm a late adopter of the anterior approach has substantially changed my, changed my mindset when I'm speaking to patients. And I can tell them, listen, if you are my family member, I think you're a good candidate for the anterior approach. If you are my family member, you're a poor candidate for the anterior approach based on my own criteria. And maybe Dr. Hosak, who has done many thousands of them, will have criteria that are, com are completely different. And maybe Dr. Higuera Rueda will have different criteria. Uh, so I think that that is something that has changed in my practice by being a late adopter of a surgical approach. Yeah, it's an important point, Alejandro, but Bill, you are an experienced surgeon, diet anterior approach. We have two experienced surgeons here, Per and, and Bill. I mean, can you tell us your opinion about that, Bill? Yeah, I'll give you um, my opinion. Um, I want to make a strong statement that the uh, topic of same-day discharge and quick recovery is independent, unrelated to the surgical approach. Okay, I just want to make sure that we understand that very clearly and which approach is chosen is a personal decision. If you um, are doing a very good job with the posterior approach, I suggest you don't look for alternatives because stick with what you know. If uh, the best way to learn the new approach, because I've been teaching this over over 20 years now, uh, is to do a residency training program, then a fellowship before you adopt the approach in your practice. So uh, that's where you get through the learning curve and become a more proficient surgeon to minimize complications. So that would be my suggestion regarding the approach. I'll let great. her weigh in on this. Yeah, great advice. Great advice. Thank you so much. And Bert. I'm short leap from, from Denmark. Uh, I'm doing the posterior approach for full life. But in two years, 2007 and eight, uh, we were more or less forced to do the DAA because of the patients. They came and requested to have the anterior approach. So we were trained in France, and I think we were pretty nice in doing it. But uh, like uh, Carlos said, uh, we had some complications, and then we discussed whether the learning curves was okay for us. So we went back, and, and, and in Denmark, uh, the DAA is very limited. But in very contrast to my neighbor country, Norway, where more than 50% today are being done by the DAA. So um, I think there's a culture, and the culture is what, when a country is, is keen in, in one approach, uh, the neighbor clinics in, in the country will, will support that, and the, you will train each other in it. Because Denmark and Norway are very similar countries and very contrast in the approach. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. I mean, we have a, a very wide view of what is happening and different opinions about this rapid recovery. And then, uh, Alejandro, we will move to the next block. I mean, we will start with this block with different experience from different points around the world. And if you don't mind, Alejandro, we'll, I will start with uh, Victor Hernandez from uh, Miami uh, University, who will talk about IRAS protocol in total hip arthroplasty, current situation in US. Victor? Hi, and thank you everyone uh, for inviting me, Oliver, Alejandro. Uh, it's a pleasure to me uh, present ERAS protocol in USA, the current situation. This is a conflict of interest, none of them are related. Everybody knows enhanced recovery was first described by Henry Killett, professor uh, from colon surgery, several years ago. And he demonstrated that through acelerated recovery, reduced cause of pain, and multi rehabilitation, there was a decrease on lack of state of the patients. So improvement in total hip arthroplasty has been in recent years and it's multifactorial. We have seen how much muscle sparing surgery has decreased the length of state, multimodal pain management, TX8, and ERAS recovery protocols has influenced. And if we see the last 20 years in the United States, we have gone from 2000 to having average of 5.2 days, uh, average of length of stays decreased year after year. And it's like that, that for the past 
12, the past 10 years, we have decreased from being three days in the hospital to 1.4. This is an average from the American Joint Replacement Registry that shows 1.4 in 2021. It's what normally a hip replacement is in the hospital. As of today, we have switched to measure dates, to measure hours of recovery. So that's the amount of impact that ERAS and all these uh, changes has become that as of today, we measure hours. And we have seen that hip replacement is gonna exponentially increase for the uh, next 10 or 12 years. And it was a report from one of the SG2, which is one of the uh, commercial advisors for health in the United States. In 2019, before COVID, there was already a change in the United States from being a hospital inpatient. Most of the uh, orthopedic cases were transferred into an outpatient or an ASC center. So 31% in 2019 were moving towards outpatient recovery. An elective hip and knee replacement was expected in 2019 in 10 years to increase almost 62%. But then COVID hit and actually exponentially all these problems. And everybody was asking, how are we going to do the surgeries now that patients cannot stay in the hospital? So a patient surgery came as a re uh, to the rescue. And it's different in terminology, as Dr. Hosa was saying. It's different when you say extended recovery versus standard recovery versus rapid recovery versus outpatient or same-day discharge. So we have to be clear what we're talking about. Medicare is the major payment uh, that uh, the health system has in the United States. It pays for about 60% of the hip replacement in USA. But in 2019, total hip replacement was considered an inpatient-only surgery. So that means for the hospital, the reimbursement was for one day, 7,000 versus three days, which the reimbursement was almost 10,000. So outpatient surgery was not financially possible in this population for the hospital environment. But then in 2020, uh, January 1st, Total hip replacement was removed from the inpatient only list that required a patient to stay in the hospital overnight to be approved to stay for less than 23 hours. And that was a big change because as of today in 2023, elective hip replacement, 81% of the surgery that's done in the United States as considered as a 23 state of hospitalization. And CMS, which is Medicare part, has increased the reimbursement for uh, being these surgeries done in an ASC center by 3.8%. So there's a financial incentives that the hospital needs to move out of the hospital to an outpatient center. And we have seen. So this is from ACAS last year. There was a, qu a question about how many surgeons are doing outpatient. And almost 70% of the surgeons in the United States they do some kind of an outpatient and more than almost half percent of them, they do a quarter of their patients as a, as a same day discharge. So we have moved. And the only way that we have moved from traditional to rapid recovery is through uh, one of the ERAS protocol. And in the United States, we even uh, have a chapter from the ERAS Society of USA, which give recommendations to multiple subspecialties, including hip and spine uh, surgeries. And they do have a consensus statement that was created in 2020, which uh, everybody in the United States who wants to follow enhanced recovery, there is this consensus statement for perioperative care that you can follow. Uh, this is our protocols at, at the University of Miami. We do have preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative, and discharge mm -hmm. protocols. We have moved from being the outpatient I to an inpatient. We be personally mm -hmm. invite the patient mm -hmm. to participate mm -hmm. in the pre-educational Zoom mm -hmm. joint class mm -hmm. when we go mm -hmm. over uh, physical mm -hmm. uh, exercise mm -hmm. that they can do at home and how to prepare towards the surgery. It doesn't depend on our institution. We have the three different approach and it doesn't depend on any of these type of approaches as we were discussing before. It depends more on half an ERAS program team working together as a surgeon, patient, nursing, PT, occupational therapy, and anesthesia. It's like kind of restaurant. We, and, and the orthopedic surgeon is, is the director. The patient needs to feel free uh, we, we have created a culture of wellness on the patients, 
we have created something we call the life <laughs> skills gym. It's like a little house that the patient can, um, uh, with PT and OT, normally goes to a uh, car simulator, a bathroom, and a house and a kitchen. And we can spend time with the patient. Then we send the patient home with several videos on how to do it. Normally, post-operative patients are out of bed within the three hours from surgery. The, di the discharge criteria is, it has been very established. Uh, we do have some wearable devices that we send patients home, and we can track these patients and how they do. We measure from temperature to pain score to exercise, and we can follow in uh, uh, almost by the minute of the patient how they're doing. Normally, postoperative care, patients receive a call the next day, they go home. Uh, and over, uh, we'll call three days after we see the patients every patient's two weeks in telemedicine and then we will we see this patient in person six weeks it has been well established in the united states that doing outpatient on same days discharge can decrease up to 20 percent of the total bill cost and the total charge is almost 2500 less when we do outpatient surgery the joint commission is one of the most uh, established system that accredited uh, hospitals in the United States. And for you to be able to reach out the advanced total hip and knee replacement certification, you need to follow ERAS protocol. So this is a strong recommendation. There are 17 points that they will uh, recommend that you have in place to be accredited. And in conclusion, implementation of ERAS protocols in hip replacement is possible when you have a multidisciplinary team effort and total hip replacement continue to be grow driven by policies, technology, and clinical improvement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor. Moving to the next uh, presentation, uh, it's an honor to present Peter Noon. Uh, Peter and I, we know each other for many years. We met, I believe, in uh, Southern uh, UK during the a meeting of the British Hip Society. He was born in Belgium, but currently practices on the British Channel in Swansea in the Warndane Hospital. Uh, Peter is going to give us the view from the other side of the Atlantic. So Peter, great to have you. Thank you for being here and we look forward to your talk. So uh, good afternoon from the UK. Good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Peter. Um, I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons who will die. Um, so I don't have any conflicts of interest. And um, I would like to uh, start off with, we were uh, we were invited to the first World Society Congress of um, Enhanced Recovery Team. And what I did is I took my team with me and here was an, uh, my one of my initiatives talking to Henry Keller to start off the program with us. And that really put everything in, pers uh, in perspective. And uh, we we were we were able to to start off following that discussion where we took our physiotherapists, our nurses and uh, our initiatives down to to see Henrik. So um, we had a great presentation from Victor, and I would say, is there an Atlantic Ridge? No, I don't think there is an Atlantic Ridge. Um, we're, we're just in some countries a little bit slower than you are in the United States. A day case surgery has only started very recently in the UK over the last couple of years, where I think in, in the United States has been going on for 15 years. In Sweden, it's it's been going on for three or four years. In Denmark, it's a bit longer. But I think Europe is just having different speeds at the moment. Uh, we all know about the ripple effects, geographically, specialty, uh, subspecialty as well. We started a lot in total hip replacement orthopedics, but no knees and, and, and lumbar surgery as well. And you can see from the slide below that um, as there is an er enhanced recovery society in the United States, we've got them in Switzerland, we've got them in Spain, we've got them in Sweden, we've got the UK, we've got them in Italy. So many, many countries are now having enhanced recovery societies. And currently, enhanced recovery is accepted as best practice. Uh, we started in Wales in, in 20, uh, 2009, and it was a part of the Thousand Lives campaign with the, really the main driver was uh, reducing the length of stay. So what are the current guidelines? And I think we've seen that from the previous uh, discussion as well, or the previous presentation. So it all started with Tom Wainwright and an MDT panel of experts, surgeons, physicians, anesthetists, physiotherapists. And it was a critical appraisal of the literature and consensus agreement, which was based on the great assessment of evidence and also the great assessment of strength of recommendations. 17 topics of interest and all supported by the enhanced recovery and developing a unified protocol. So this is what it is in, in, in this quadrant. Uh, we start preoperatively information counseling. Everybody's been speaking so far about information counseling. Extremely important. Optimization of the patient, smoke cessation. If you've got a smoke cessation service, alcohol reduction, anemia correction uh, is known um, in the UK, enhanced by the anesthetist as well, and physio and prehabilitation. 
fasting. Uh, nowadays, we say sip till you drip, so the patients can drink little amounts of clear fluids until uh, they go to the anesthetic uh, room. Perioperatively standardized an anesthetic protocols. I think we're still a little bit further away from, from you guys in the States with that. Everybody seems to be doing what they want, but there's more and more drive to go to short acting. Local infiltration allergies and nerve blocks, the, um, there's no evidence what, that one is better than the other. Personally, I don't use local infiltration analgesia because my anesthetist gives a good anesthetic block and my local infiltration would work as long as, as his, his um, sensory block. So I, I don't do that. Um, avoidance of perioperative nausea and vomiting, extremely important because this is one of the, the main concerns of patients following surgery is the being, being sick. Normal termia, DVT, uh, prophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis. Prevention of perioperative blood loss has been discussed as well. Uh, we, we stick to the trans, tra uh, transmenic acid. Perioperative fluid management, not too, not too much, not too little. And perioperative surgical factors, good surgical technique, whether you use a posterior approach or an anterior approach or even a direct lateral approach, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you do a good job. Uh, try to reconstruct anatomy so patients can, can mobilize quickly afterwards. Post-operatively, multimodal analgesia, whatever you do, if possible, use some anti-inflammatories, avoid some morphine. Early mobilization, as we, we, we discussed, and then criteria based discharge for going home. We currently in our hospital don't send patients home uh, the same day, but next day, uh, quite a lot of them are going home. And what is extremely important if you start off this process is having data, um, having data and see where you can make some improvements and then making sure that the improvements are getting followed. Nutritional care, uh, something that, that is, is quite important as well is, you, you know, you want these patients to recover quickly and, and feeding them is, is quite, quite important. So uh, we've seen this slide before with the recommendation grades um, and, and the evidence. So I'm not going to go to that again. Um, but where is the evidence? And there are two articles that came to mind, and, and both of them uh, where one of the main authors is, is an anesthetist from, from the uh, New York area. Uh, and Kellett is involved in both of them as well. So I think this is quite important and it's quite philosophical as well. It be began as a patient-centered science based on clear pathophysiology principles. And this should not be replaced by uncertain scientific approaches that seek to replace true measures of recovery, such as complications, readmissions, quality of life, and length of, and with length of stay. And what we've, what we heard in all this presentation at the moment is, is, you know, this is this drive to having this as a day case and reduce length of stay. That is quite important. And when we started our program, uh, the neighboring hospital was saying, oh, we can send our patients home uh, at day one. But then we have nurses running around uh, as if they would be in a hotel. Well, that didn't save any money. Uh, that really didn't reduce the length of stay because you had the same nurses having to go outside and, and um, look after these patients at home. So what we want to do is we want to send these patients home and they need to be independent and able to look after themselves safely. So just be careful when we, we put the drive on length of stay. And then uh, Kellen uh, Mitsuzis in 2020 says there is still an improvement with a more critical reanalysis of data. And I really appreciate what Carlos said, you know, that the data from, from the Cleveland uh, Clinic where they look at the data again and again and again and make sure which components are most important. And also what is very important is the post-discharge functional recovery of these patients. And what about the patient experience? So Wang, and, Wang did a, a systemic review and qualitative analysis and they did 31 studies, used 31 studies in Europe and Europe and the USA, uh, four in hip and knee, and they used the SPO model. So structure, what patients want is timeliness of surgery, professionalism and safety, the process, the information, and we talked about this before, information, communication, and really what they, what they really want is a personalized treatment. So what, personalized treatment doesn't need to be personalized, personalized, but, but, you know, it needs to be adapted to patients, uh, patients' problems and, and patients' expectations. And a follow-up service. When you discharge a patient, they don't need to be left by themselves. They need to be have able to uh, need to be able to access some 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 quality care without having to go to uh, call an out of hours doctor or end up in an accident and emergency department. So the outcome, uh, what was really very important for these patients, is improved severe post-operative symptoms. And whether this is on a ward or whether this is at home, you know, we need to address that that. With, with detail, you know, the post-operative symptoms need to make sure that patients can regain their life as quickly as possible. So if you look at the qualitative research to identify teams for the patients, you know, pain management is important. Lack of continuous medical support seems to be a concern for this patient. Inconsistent information, information tailored to the patient, care support at home, late referrals for surgery, especially now in the UK, where we got waiting list up to four years. 
you know, this is this is not good. You know, we, we're gonna we're gonna struggle getting patients home the day of surgery because they're completely de- deconditioned and access to support and resources. So we've discussed it all uh, in the meeting. You know, the information, information, Please, information, sir, information. So um, fast track program in Swedish hospital. Uh, the study from from um, Urban Bergy, uh It says was well, safe. Proms at least as good as conventional. So we got approved there, but. We need to focus more on period of discharge, improved recovery, patient satisfaction, and functional outcome, the importance of a patient-centered approach. So what is a staff experience? It is complex and challenging. It is teamwork. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody's on board and have local champions. What is the future of enhanced recovery and what are the links? Well, first of all, I think we've discussed it all. Standardization of care, improving outcomes, reducing direct and indirect costs. So we're really trying to get the value-based healthcare principles in here. And it needs to be true evidence-based. Uh, and really, you know, we need to base ourselves on, on evidence. So in conclusions, um, what we want is a patient-centered approach for enhanced recovery, team-based approach. So the whole team needs to be on, on board. Check the evidence and relate to your own practice. Evaluate and adapt for your local situation. So what you can offer in, in your hospital and in your geographical area and enhance recovery over the complete pathway, just not the part within the hospital. Thank you very much for your attention. And it was a pleasure to uh, be invited for this talk. Thank you, Peter. Please uh, keep on time because we have many speakers and we have time for discussion. We need time for discussion. So next speaker will be Luis Chan from Hong Kong and we'll talk about, about the perspective uh, in, uh, in, in Asia. Luis. So thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Luis from Hong Kong. So Professor Harry Kerner is the pioneers in Euros. As you know, uh, Professor Harry Kerner is based in Denmark. So both of the uh, development in the U.S. protocol is uh, based on Europe. This is the wrong map by the U.S. societies. The circle map the center of excellence in U.S. societies. As you can see, most of the center is concentrated in Europe, and some of the centers is in the America. There's only a few centers in Asia that was identified as the centers of excellence in U.S. societies. These are the few centers I call uh, the Pacific Oceans so that was identified as the center of excellence, including center in Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, Singapore, and we have other qualified centers in Taiwan, India, and Philippines. So here is uh, some of the published protocol in Australia and New Zealand, and you can see they start the program around the 2015 and 2016. So how about Singapore? As driven by COVID because of the high back situations during COVID time. So Singapore derived similar po- protocol uh, for the U.S. program around the time of COVID. So how about Hong Kong? This is the best situations among public hospital in Hong Kong. You can see very crowded best situations. During the COVID time, even we don't have work for those COVID patients. So actually, this have a significant drive to develop U.S. program in our locality, Hong Kong. So as a result, we have overseas trainings. So actually, we had overseas training in Denmark. We, we had attention in, with Professor Anderson and Professor Han Kellett in Denmark in 2015. And afterwards, we developed our U.S. program. Here's the main principle we learned from uh, Denmark. One of the main principles of U.S. is to reduce the stress response after surgery so as to shorten the time for the recovery after the surgery. Here are some of the methods to reduce stress after surgery. I think most of the speakers have gone through all the main things, how to decrease stress, so I'm not going to go into details. So after the training, we derive our program. So in public hospital, we run similar U.S. programs. The elderly patients especially benefit a lot from the U.S. program because, you know, elderly patients, once they in bed, they have more prone to have complications. We also run similar program in our private hospital. So we also have good results from the US program. So here is one of our patients. So day one after total heat can be discharged from a hospital, just stay overnight. This is uh, one of the record in Hong Kong. So I want to go further. So this is a uh, hip precautions after total heat replacement surgery. We have a little bit discussions whether a surgical approach, we're going to interface the dislocation range. But in general, this kind of hip precautions is, to me, is a little bit traditional because it may hinder 
the patients recovering in the fast track rehabilitation. But now, uh, actually, we did a study compare those patients with very rigid strict hip precautions versus those patients without much hip precautions after total hip replacement. We found that patients with minimal precautions actually have a shortening of stay. One year after surgery, patients do report better health outcomes and health perceptions. With robotic technology, right now we can place in a very manner in terms of diversions and inclinations. So can we reduce the hip precautions after total hip replacement surgeries? So this is a uh, one. So in this robotic technology, we can test the virtual range of motions. As you can see here, with the implant positioning, we can test the implant position in different angles to see any impingement and then correct uh, the dislocation range after total hip replacement surgery. So this is one of my patients. After total hip replacement robotic technology, you can see it can test the hip precautions patients can have full scotting, which is also sometimes is necessary among our Asian patients because of the religious belief. But how about challenge of evils in our Asian countries? As you can see, the average living space in different countries is different. I think the living space in Hong Kong is particularly very limited. So you can see from this week, photos here, this is the living environment in Hong Kong. This is a typical living fact of uh, Lower soul class in Hong Kong, the actually they did cook inside the toilet. The living room actually not much space. They also this is sleeping room also of the living room. So as a result, some of my patients after the total replacement surgery, they refuse to be disruption because actually you can see here there's no space for these patients to have rehab patients. So to run the US program in different countries, there's uh, also cultural and also space limitations according to the uh, environment in different countries. So here's a conclusion. So even in the Pacific regions, I think we want similar principles, but more work to be done to increase the coverage. As you can see the world map, there's only few Asian countries have EVAS program. And I think one way to go forward, we, I hope to minimize the hip precautions of total hip replacement because this sound of hip precautions is a little bit traditional. So with that, thank you for your attention. Ping, thank you so much. Uh, moving forward to introducing Nico Restrepo. Uh, Nico is an orthopedic surgeon in the University Hospital of Nariño. Nariño is a city just two hours north of the border with Ecuador in Colombia. Uh, this is southwest Colombia. So, Nico, we know each other for over 20, 25 years, and uh, it's great to see you all the time. And uh, listen, we look forward to what you have to say. Go ahead. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Latin America has 33 countries, including Caribbean, with different populations and different health systems. That's the real problem in Latin America. Our, our country are covered almost 100% uh, social security, but some countries only 10%. Uh, the health system and the urbanizations affect completely the applications of enhanced recovery after surgery programs in Latin America. For example, Rogelio Ray from Uruguay told us that all arthroplasty are provided by the state, but they have two day hospitalizations and everyone well, wants to use those days. So nobody wants to go ambulatory. In Colombia, Dr. Jairo Rincon led the, this fantastic ERAS uh, program begin in 2027. And last year they have 700 total hip arthroplasty, 85% ambulatory, and they have a good home care program. But in other countries, it must be in between. Depends mainly of the individual efforts from universities, some, some clinics, and to make the difference. And the, the problem is that the insurance coverage in all Latin America prefers to stay one or two days at the hospital. For me, the errors start 10 years ago, 18 years ago, when I visited the Royce Presbyterian Hospital with Dr. Berker, doing twin sessions. And since then, 18 years ago, I began a one day discharge from the hospital. 70% of our population live outside of my capital and 15% need motorcycle, even horse to arrive at home four, five uh, hours late. Initially, we don't have home care, but right now, yes. 
and what we have improved and what we have changed to make our troplasty from one day to ambulatory. Uh, all have preparative physiotherapy to begin two sessions, learn to walk, sit in the car, sit in the bathroom, climb up the same stairs, and walk around cane uh, to avoid this location posture, and it begins very well. Uh, the ambulatory admissions began more uh, strict uh, in ambulatory. We have an ASA2 uh, hemoglobin at less than 75.5 uh, and BMI uh, less than 30%. They have an average walk distance 200 meters uh, within needed uh, known or single point stick. And for course, they have family support. It's uh, the problem uh, and it's the most important part. And that the distance from our hospital must be in a good road, one hour max. We don't use pre-anesthetic medications in both the scenarios. Uh, we change the anesthetic protocol from one day using PCI to the anesthetic protocol with neuroaxial techniques without opioids. And we use local infiltrative analgesia. Uh, we tried, but we discontinued femoral blood. Uh, right now, we're trying some other uh, uh, protocols. And the operative approach is quite amazing. We prefer the straight lateral, the mini Watson, in one day. And to begin, as Alejandro told, I tried the, anterior, the direct anterior approach, but get back soon, as Carlos. <laughs> and I have uh, the same approach, the, the, the mini lateral. Uh, but we know in all Latin America, good service working with all different approaches. We use other medications, uh, the only one dose prophylaxis, and we use on dance drug, uh, and we continue the thromboprophylaxis. We multimodal analgesia is without opioids, diperone, paracetamol, and non sates and we use amitriptyline and pre or pregabalin to get better uh, at night. The criteria based discharge are uh, too strict. They have to take intake tolerance, vital sign is stable for six to eight hours post-operative, ability to walk and use walker for 20 meters, sit and rise from a chair, uh, the analog visual pain uh, less than four, and no urinary irritation. This is our patients, and they uh, stimulate to begin to walk without use of canes, without use of crutches, and the post-operative care, uh, the people go to his home without ambulance. They have to uh, make a telephone call once he arrives at home. We have a, a, a special uh, home care when the physician and physical therapist go home daily for the first three days, and then we go every two days. And the control is by me between 10 and 15 days post-operative. Uh, it's important in Latin America, this patient willing, uh, Dr. Julio Cesar Palacio make a, a good survey, 150% after surgery, uh, answer this survey at Clinic in Banaco, and all have preferred to stay one day. My patient willings, uh, and that's my numbers, we have uh, 32,022 from 3,050 preferred one day. And the main reason is the difficult to come back at home in the evening because they live far. The analysis of Latin American experiences that in all country, longer stays are not common, mostly persists more, only more than two or three days from discharge. In big atroplasty centers in all Latin America is one day and some ambulatory, and the ambulatory programs well established provide with good home care and fast response possibility if the patient have to come back. We are dependent on the national care system, urbanizations, and patient willing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nico, for, for the point of view from Latin America with this approach. And the last speaker and the last talk here will be by Per Hasgarden Andersen from Bell in Denmark. And he will talk about value based eras protocol economical issues. Per. Thank you, Oliver. Also, in this presentation, I do not have any countries of interest. I'm living in a country where the government, uh, the, the one who pay the bill, and uh, on top of this, there are private clinics, which are uh, financed privately from the patients and from the insurance company. And here you can see what has changed in my country over 10 years. Earlier, the private clinics were taking around 10%, and today it's 50-50. 
And I think this is important when you discuss economy in a country like Denmark, because the private clinics, they only do the easy cases, the complicated cases have to go to the public hospitals. In Denmark, we are reimbursed by something called DRG, which is dose related groups. Given that you get a fixed amount of money, which is decided by the government for each case you're doing, and they don't care about the length of stay for the patients. So this is an incitament to reduce length of stay. And this is what they give us currently, is 7,012 US dollars uh, for one case. And in a clinic like mine, and here I have some slides back from 2018, where you can see we have increased dramatically. This is a public hospital doing close to 2,000 joints currently. And at the same time, the length of stay has been reduced. Uh, as you heard earlier today, we're doing close to 80% of all hips as the daycare uh, system. It is evidently that there is a benefit here. But in a public system like mine, this is a significant uh, reduction in the length of stay. And more cases are now done in the same bed because we have only lost a few beds in this time. So financially, in the government and system, there are no main thing to earn here, but we treat a lot of more patients for the same money. In contrast, in the private clinics in Denmark, there's a major uh, gain in economy. I could stop here, but I think I'll just show you uh, what we have used this for in Denmark in a few slides. Of course, we compare two clinics, one from Copenhagen and my own hospital from Weile. They are pretty similar. The one of them is in the, uh, the rural area and the other one is in the capital area. And we looked at these three levels, uh, where what we're going to do. My own clinic here, you can see we really went down in all details to see where do we use the minutes and what is the costs. Even here in the uh, time during uh, the uh, stay in the hospitals, time in Pacure, and after uh, sending patient home, after day after surgery and the, the long follow-up, everything was monitored very detailed, so we have an idea on what is the cost. At the same time, they did exactly the same, although a little different setup in uh, the Copenhagen, and due to the time, I will not go down in details here, but show you what was the outcome. Surprisingly, you can see the cost when you take away the implants in in uh, uh, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, was close to 2.5 thousand US dollars for the personal cost and everything besides the implants, and more or less the same for total knee in my clinic, and more or less the same for the for the hip in my clinic. So what we learned here is that there are no major difference in cost between the two hospitals, but in the governmental setup clinics in Denmark, it's the personal. So if you want to sh save some money in a governmental situation, you have to say goodbye to some personal or to some uh, setups. And this is what they decided to do in Copenhagen. They simply shifted out the PECU, patient go directly to the department. They looked at, at the seminar and, and took away the seminar and give it now as a video, as you saw earlier. We did more or less the same in Denmark. Uh, and in conclusion, that if you in a governmental system want to earn money, you have to reduce length of stay and do more cases. This is how to do it. In a private clinic, it's completely opposite. Sorry to the very short presentation, but I think in the interest of time and for discussion, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Burr. I really appreciate your short talk in that case, <laughs> because we need to have a few minutes for discussion. We have to start a little bit later than the than the original uh, time so we have like five minutes for discussion and and there is one question uh, from the audience this uh someone from argentina that uh, asked about what could be the possible specific measures for enhanced recovery in patient of total hip arthroplasty with high risk status who, who wants to answer i mean a patient with high risk Victor, how how you manage that? Yeah, so so elect, total hip replacement is a very elective surgery, and every patient needs to be optimized. Uh, either the patient has diabetes, cardiac conditions, uh, so optimization is key in all these protocols. Uh, 
Patients that probably are never or very difficult to optimize are patients that probably are not good candidate for the hip surgery. So I think with optimization and working in conjunction with cardiologists or uh, endocrinologists to get this patient into sur- safely into surgery can easily be discharged. We have very complex cases at my institution. We have a, tra- uh, a transplant center. And even in these patients, we can do outpatient surgery. So it's it's doable, but you need to have a good team. It's great, great reply. I mean, Bill, can you comment on that? Yeah, I just want to re- remind you, our, in the last over the last three years, over 20% of the patients that go home the same day are in our practice were ASA3. Um, again, remember the... ASA three categories and anesthesia classification related to risk of anesthesia. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the patient cannot experience a rapid recovery program. I, I think you have to separate those two out, right? And they don't necessarily have to go home, but they can be, ha- be have an enhanced recovery and go home sooner than they might otherwise go home. Amazing. Bear, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I, I'll just follow up on one, what Bill just said because ASA three. You can easily do them uh, in the daycare setup um, when you convince them that they have to go home, but also when you listen to them and see them on the day, uh, whether they can or not, and then support them in, in stay one night over. But um, but we learned a lot about uh, ASA3 patients from our anesthetist, and today most of them go home also. Thank you. Carlos? I think that really quick, if you look at all the literature, there are like three or four things that are high prediction for, as, as Alejandro said, failure to launch. If you have a BMI higher than 40, if you have a difficult airway, if you have sleep apnea, history of sleep apnea, at least uh, that one is one that I fight, but, but that I fight, but I think that is clear in the literature. If you have an implantable deva- deva- device, like, um, like a pacemaker, uh, all those uh, four things, at least from the healthcare point of view, are predictors uh, for failure to launch, if not necessarily the ASA. Thank you, Carlos. Nico, you raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Hosa told us, we, if you don't have an ERAS program, you must begin with baby footsteps. Uh, and I begin with uh, people less than 65, uh, no uh, ASA2 with good ability to work to begin your program. And you have to, you have, for most, you have good uh, family uh, cover that keep you home safely and stay with you. Peter? Yeah, I think to answer the question is that there's a couple of things. First of all, you need to make sure that the patient is as optimized as possible. So all modifiable risk factors need to be modified. Some of them you can't, and then you will take the risk. But the second thing you need to do is making sure that the surgical, as well as the anesthetic impact on the physiology is minimized. And that's that's what's been, been discussed here as well. You know, enhanced recovery is making sure that whether it's the approach, whether it's a combination of everything, is making sure that the patient gets through that, that surgery as un- unharmed as possible. You know, don't change the physiology by overloading this patient. Don't don't change their their, their you know making sure that they have a syncope afterwards. That will that will increase the risk of having patients in ITU and having a longer length of stay. Thank you. Interesting comment, Alejandro. Do you have any other question for the speakers or any comment on that? No, uh, just to state that I really enjoyed everybody's talks. Um, uh, thank you for spending the last uh, hour and a half with us. And I'd like to obviously thank, thank CICOT and AHKS for uh, for their support and for uh, being here uh, in this webinar. And congratulate Nico, who became the new uh, HIP chair uh, for CICOT. So we look forward to uh, working with him as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your time with us. Thank you to the American Association for Hip and Knee Surgery for collaborate with us and please look at this QR, you get your certificate just doing the survey. Here is the QR, yes, so get it and get the certificate when you do the survey. So um, the next um, uh, works in CCOT uh, are this, uh, this webinar that you can see about heat displacement in children and uh, in, uh, in October, we will have uh, another uh, HIP um, uh, webinar um, and will be the last of, of our, our session. So 
Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your time. And I hope to see you in Cairo in our uh, yearly meeting uh, with all the, the secret friends. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Chen. Good to see you.